Good morning. Good morning. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. We'll go ahead and read the text, and then we'll go ahead and go through it. It says in verse 21, beg your pardon, here we go. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered into the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated debated amongst themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all surrounding districts of Galilee. Now, the theme of this portion of Scripture stands out pretty clear, and that is that Jesus spoke with authority. It, it is speaking of the power of his words, and so it's uh, quite a coincidence that um, Holly was talking about the power of words um, in her lesson as well. It does, it does line up quite a bit here. Uh, Jesus spoke with authority in this text. It jumps out quite clearly. He spoke with authority when he taught in the temple. He spoke with authority when he drove out the demon. And his authority in particular is what stood out to the people. Uh, we see this repeatedly. If you look in verse 23 of the text, follow along with me. You'll want to keep that passage open because I'm going to be quoting verses from it uh, regularly. I'm not going to put them up on the screen. But in verse 23 it says, They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And in verse 27, it says that they were all amazed. So they debated amongst themselves, saying, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So again, the theme is that Jesus spoke with authority. And the big question that we need to answer this morning is, what does that mean? What does it mean to speak with authority? For some, when we think of speaking with authority, what may come to mind is the presentation. And what I mean by the presentation is uh, the poise, the voice inflection, the loud and clear declarations and things like that. Uh, We can see this this sort of thing emphasized in some of the health and wealth preachers that we see on TV. Um, In these broadcasts, um, there can be a lot of authority emphasized and they will be claiming and binding and pronouncing and such things like that in the name of Jesus. And this can be done with a good bit of dramatic inflection and theatrics that can appear to be very authoritative to some people. Now, the reason that comes to mind is a few months back, a guitarist on YouTube, on his YouTube channel, took note of one of Kenneth Copeland's authoritative uh, moments on against what he was speaking against COVID-19 for some reason. I don't watch the show, but there was a clip recently. Um, he, and he converted it into a heavy metal song. I'd never seen anything like this done before. And it was so interesting that I would encourage you guys to go and to uh, check it out. If you just type in Google and heavy metal, you'll see, you'll see this is what the, the clip looks like. But you have um, basically Ken, Kenneth Copeland there saying, I pronounce judgment on you, COVID-19. I demand a vaccination now. And he's speaking very intensely. And in the background, you have a guy playing a heavy metal riff. And it sounded just like a heavy metal song. It was amazing. Um, But uh, my point here is, is that for some, speaking with authority tends to be more about the presentation than anything else. Uh, It can be about making declarations in a way that appears to be authoritative. But the text goes into absolutely no detail whatsoever on Jesus' method of presentation. Our text this morning doesn't go into any detail about that at all. It gives us no clue whether he spoke loudly or softly, whether he gestured or remained still, etc. It says that he spoke with authority and that his authority was recognizable by everyone present, including the demons, and that's it. Nothing else. That's all that it says. So this morning, I can't really present the three steps to speaking with authority. I can't give you something specific to do in order to speak with authority because the method simply isn't given in the text. The text simply says that Jesus spoke with authority, period. 
With this in mind, in order to apply this passage to our lives today, we need to unpack what it, what it means, what the text means by speaking with authority. And the text does give us information on that, on what it means. It shows us both what speaking with authority means in general and what speaking with Christ's authority looks like specifically. The text actually unpacks both. So we'll begin with what speaking with authority means in general. And so follow along on your outlines as we do this. We're gonna start with in general first. Generally speaking, the people said, that Jesus spoke with authority because when he spoke, things happened. When he spoke, things happened. When he taught, people's minds were blown. It said, it said that they were amazed. When he commanded, the demons shrieked and fled. There was power in his words, which brought about tangible results that people felt. When he spoke, things happened. Does that make sense? And the text clarifies that this power had absolutely nothing to do with the way that he spoke. It wasn't a function of the inflection or poise or anything like that. It had everything to do with who he is. It had nothing to do with his, um, with his method. It had everything to do with the way that he is. Quite simply, Jesus spoke with authority because he is the son of God. And the demon that he cast out understood this clearly. If you look back in your text at verse 24, at one point he says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. He recognized him. He recognized who he was. Jesus' authority is a function of his identity and position. He has authority because he is the Lord. And hopefully you're able to see here why I say there's no how-to manual to be able to speak with authority like Jesus did. He spoke with authority because who he is. This isn't a skill that can be developed in the normal way that we might develop a method. And, and uh, you have to, you, you must have authority to speak with authority and you either have authority or you don't have authority. Jesus has it, thus when, when he spoke, he spoke with authority and things happened. It was as simple as that. And perhaps the one who understood this the best in the entire New Testament might have been the centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant. And I'm, just, I'm reading a lot of scripture this morning, so I'm going to give you the addresses to write down in your bulletin, but I'm not going to stream all the words up on the board for you this morning. But this is where you'll find it. This is Matthew 8, verses 5 through 10. It says, When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, begging him, and said, My Lord... Excuse, excuse me, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, terribly tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Do you see the centurion's understanding? Just speak the word. Just speak the word and it will be done. And he said, he said this because he said, I am also under authority. I have the authority of Rome behind me. So when I speak, things happen. But he was also noting that Jesus had, authority, had the authority of the kingdom of God behind him, which was so much greater than Rome. Therefore, when Jesus spoke, he ha things happened in a much greater way. He could just speak here. He didn't need to show up at the house. He could just speak. And the sickness would leave him. And note Jesus' affirmation of the centurion in verse 10. I'm just going to read it to you. It says, Now when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Um, and so Jesus, um, depending upon the translation here, it says he marveled at the faith of the centurion. And he said, Man, this guy gets it better than everybody in, in Israel. This guy really gets it here. Jesus spoke with authority quite simply because he has authority. And he has authority because of who he is. He is a Lord. And with this in mind, the only way that we can speak with authority is to have authority. Without authority, we can bluster commands and we can make declarations with the, fi the finest and firmest of poise and of inflection, but nothing's gonna happen. You have to have authority for something to happen. Now the question is this, are we out of luck? is speaking with authority out of our reach. What do you think? The answer is no. Why? Because as the church today, we serve as Christ's representatives in the world, 
and we bear his authority by nature of that position. We serve as his representatives, and by, because of that position, we bear his authority. Now, Jesus repeatedly and emphatically spoke of the kingdom authority that his disciples would, ha- would have after his departure, and so I'm going to list some of these passages for you now if you want to jot them down. But the first one is probably the most obvious one. This is the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Jesus is at first reminding the disciples of his um, um, absolute limitless authority of, as, uh, in the kingdom of God. And then he commissions them under that authority to work on the earth to go and make disciples in his name. And so we bear his authority. His disciples bear that authority. Now here's another one. This is interesting as well. Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. Therefore I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. And so here Jesus speaks of how the power of God's kingdom would be behind whatever the church said and whatever the church did on the earth. He was saying when you bind, the authority of the kingdom is going to come behind and support that. When you loose, the authority of the kingdom is going to come by, come behind you and support that. When you ask for anything in my name, the kingdom of authority is going to grant that to you. Uh, His authority, his kingdom authority was going to be behind everything that they did. Now, here's another one. This is uh, John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. This one's interesting. It's confusing, but when you understand authority and what's going on there, it helps make sense of some of it. Not all of it, but some of it. It says, this is when um, Jesus appeared to his disciples. It says, so Jesus said to them, peace be to you, just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And then there's this interesting verse in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. So again, the disciples are commissioned in Jesus' name, and then they are empowered by the Holy Spirit. It says he breathed upon them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I think it would be correct to understand this, at least synonymous in some ways, with the authority that they receive. There, there's authority in some verses, there's empowerment in other verses, but the idea there is they're receiving power to carry out the commission. And then there's this verse about forgiveness forgiving sins. Uh, he's, he's basically saying that he speaks of forgiving sins as though it's in their realm. You know, if sins are forgiven, they're forgiven. If they're retained, they're retained. It's confusing, and I don't want to delve into it, but you get the idea here that he's speaking of the immense authority of the kingdom being behind what they said and did in his name. So when Jesus ascended, his disciples were given Christ's authority to represent him. Thus, as they ministered, they were able to speak with authority just as he did. And Jesus was was, uh, preparing them for this in John chapter 14 when he said, and I quote, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I'm going to my Father. He was telling them in advance, you're going, to be, you're going to do the same stuff I did because you're going to bear my authority. The, tr- the disciples truly did experience this authority active in their lives as the church was born in the book of Acts. When they spoke, things really, really did happen. And all you have to do is read the book of Acts and see all the incredible things that were done that God did through the, through the apostles and through the disciples. And this was so much the case that people, there was, there was one spot in Acts 5 where it says that people laid their sick along the street in hopes that Peter's shadow would fall upon them and they would be healed of whatever sickness that they had as he walked by. There was that much authority exuding from the disciples uh, at, at some periods. And so the same authority... They had authority, that's the idea we're saying here, but the same authority that the the first disciples had still applies to the church today because we still serve as Christ's representatives today. So the point here is that we can still speak with authority today. Things can still happen when we speak today because we bear the authority of Christ today. However, there is a caveat to this which is seen in John chapter 15. So here's another authority verse. Uh, by the way, this is John 15:7, um, And hear what it says because it helps to qualify this 
authority. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. You ever read those verses? They show up a lot in John. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. You're like, wow, it's a blank check there. That's, that's incredible. How does that apply? And, and here he says, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you. He's talking about the authority that we have as representatives. But there's a caveat this time. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Christ's authority, Christ's kingdom authority, is connected to a big if. If we remain in him, if we abide in Christ and his will for our lives, and if we depend upon the Spirit's power and don't look to the flesh to carry it out, these kind of things, then, and only then, will we have his authority. So practically speaking, speaking with authority isn't about trying to get authority. It's not about trying to get the power to speak and to have, thing ha- to have things happen. Speaking with authority is about submitting to God's will and depending upon God's power. And when we get this down, Christ's authority will become more present and active in our lives. And our character, by the way, will be much more suited to wield that incredible authority constructively. Because, well, it's important to realize here that um, you're familiar with, I'm assuming you're familiar with Spider-Man. Peter Parker had an uncle named Uncle Ben, and Uncle Ben had a famous saying, with great power, comes a great, great responsibility, right? You have to have the right character to be able to wield that kind of power and authority. And we get that not by seeking power, but by submitting our lives to Christ and depending upon the Holy Spirit. Those, that has to happen for us to fall in line. So speaking with authority means that when we speak, things happen. And that is in our realm to be able to experience that as we submit and follow the Lord. But the text doesn't stop here. It also explains what Christ's spoken authority looks like specifically. It doesn't just stop at saying things happen when you speak. It gives us a picture of the kind of things that happen when Christ's word goes forth. This is important because it's possible to possess, a, to possess authority in this world. It's possible to speak and to have things happen, but for that power to be used for something other than God's kingdom purpose. Would you believe me if I told you that? That makes, I think we would all agree with that. And an example of this would be that Pilate, there's lots of examples, but you know, probably a quick and easy example is, is seen in John chapter 19 and verse 10, where we see Pontius Pilate, who had this authority, and when he's speaking with Jesus just before he was crucified, Pilate said this, do you not know that I have authority to release you, and I have authority to crucify you? He wasn't lying. He had that kind of authority. Um, With a word, Pilate determined the fates of all kinds of men because of his position in the Roman government. In this case, he used his authority to crucify an innocent man that he knew was innocent. So it's possible for um, people to have authority to make things happen with their word in this fallen world, and it's also possible for that power to be used wrong. So it's important to understand what true and righteous kingdom authority looks like when it's in action. And we're in luck because this text shows us what things happen specifically when Jesus speaks. There are two things in particular that this text shows us happen when Christ speaks. And when we see these, we can be confident that we are seeing Christ's authority in action. But when these two things are lacking, we can know that there's a problem, that something's missing, that something's off, okay? The first is that when Christ is speaking, the hearts of those who hear him are illumined. When he's speaking, when Christ's word goes forth, the hearts of those who hear are illumined. In other words, when Jesus spoke, people understood God's word better. Quite simply, that's what happened here. We see this in verse 22 of the text. When the people who heard him were amazed at his teaching, and they described his teaching as authoritative in contrast to how the scribes who were usually there were teaching. He speaks as one with authority, not of the scribes. His teaching was authoritative. It was powerful. Now, if we were just to describe what the people in our text experience in today's language, we might, you know, if we were to kind of talk about it more plainly, we might put it this way. They, if you can just imagine people had been uh, worshiping in the same synagogue for years, and they had been hearing the same stuff taught over and over and over again. And it wasn't that what they were hearing was wrong. They agreed with the principle behind what was being taught, but they'd heard it all before, and it wasn't helping them. It was just dull. And so um, day after day, month after month, year after year, 
they had this dull routine. And then all of a sudden, there was this guest speaker, Jesus of Nazareth, who they hadn't heard of before, who opened up the same text that they'd been studying for years and years and years, and he brought the text to life in a whole new and fresh way that caused the scriptures to come alive and make sense to them. They literally looked at them and they were looking at what they were hearing and they were saying, I saw this text my entire life and I never saw this before in there. The, the scriptures were coming alive for them. That's what happened when Jesus taught. When Jesus came in and taught, he used the exact same scriptures that the scribes had been teaching from all along, but there was something about his teaching that illumined their minds and brought the scriptures alive in ways that they'd never seen before. And they described it as authoritative or powerful, unlike the teaching of the scribes. The scribes' teaching was dull. It wasn't wrong. It wasn't that what they said was theologically wrong in general, but it was just dull. And perhaps you've had this experience in your Christian walk. You go to church week after week, you hear the same old boring stuff. And it's not that you disagree with it, it's just dull. It's not insightful or helpful to you. It's like you're hearing the same stuff over and over again, and that can be depressing. Uh, that was actually my experience growing up, and even in my early adulthood years in church, and that's part of what drew me into ministry was, was, was that issue, trying to do something about that. But when Christ's authority enters the pulpit, in whatever way, the scriptures come alive, and you see new and exciting truths that you never saw before. And this should not be a random, once in a blue moon type of occurrence. It should be the norm. So if the preaching you're experiencing is consistently dull, and I have to be very careful as I'm speaking here, um, but if it's, <laughs> if it's consistently dull, and by dull, I don't necessarily mean boring as in like, you know, monotone, but it's just dull. You didn't learn anything, that kind of thing. That's not something you should settle for. It's okay to seek out enlightenment and illumination in your preaching. It's okay to expect that. You should have that, but you just need to be discerning, okay? Because just because preaching feels illuminating and exciting doesn't mean that it's right, and we'll talk about that in a couple minutes, okay? But for now, just settle with the fact that hearing the same old stuff over and over again and, and not really receiving illumination, that's not okay. You do need illumination in your life, and it's Christ's intention for you to have that. Now, one of the ways that we can recognize Christ's authority is if what is being taught is spiritually illuminating. And we can tell that Christ's authority is behind our own speech. I'm not talking about just preaching. I'm talking about individually our own speech. We can tell that Christ's authority is behind our own speech if people better understand God's word when they talk to us. This isn't just a pulpit thing. This is a living life thing day to day in your shops, your factories, your jobs, your lives, your relationships, whatever. As you're talking with people, people should understand Christ and his word a little bit better as they talk to you. If they don't, if you just ramble, ramble off a bunch of jargon and no one really gets anything that you're talking about, and you don't make any sense and you're just kind of like this all the time, then something's missing. You haven't really found Christ's authority in your speech just yet. And trying to convince people, just as a side note, trying to convince people that what we're saying is powerful, if, if, that, if that's what we're doing, if we're saying something that people already know, but we're screaming and shouting it with inflection to try to make them see how important it is, again, that's a sign that we don't have it yet. Because um, if we truly are speaking with Christ's authority, and then what we say will cut to the heart and illuminate people on its own, regardless of the voice inflection, regardless of the method. And that's good news for people like me who stutter and stammer and have no ability, never will have an ability to present with inflection. Now, the other way to recognize when Christ is speaking is when lives are enhanced, okay? Lives will be enhanced by what is being taught. And remember that we already spoke of the need to be discerning when looking for authoritative teaching. And this is because it's possible for teaching to feel exciting and illuminating initially but for that same teaching to actually bring people down rather than build them up. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's possible to hear teaching and go, oh, that's really neat, but then you apply it and you're worse for it. It's possible for that to happen. If that's going on, then what you're hearing isn't the authority of Christ. You're hearing something different, all right? Let me give you some examples. It can be exciting to hear teaching that emphasizes the Old Testament. Of course it's exciting, that's part of the scripture. But if following this teaching cuts you off from the world and stresses you out by following endless laws and ordinances that's bringing you down, it's not enhancing your life. It's hurting you. Does that make sense? 
Also, if teaching emphasizes the spirit realm, it's understandable that that might be exciting, all right, to hear about spiritual warfare and the things going on in the spirit realm. The Bible talks about that so it can be exciting and illuminating to learn about these things. But if following that teaching makes you paranoid of demons attacking you from everywhere, then it's bringing you down. It's not enhancing your life. Not only should it be illuminating and exciting, but it should make your life better. And if it does not, then there's a problem. Jesus' teaching in our text not only illuminated people's hearts, but it also enhanced people's lives in very tangible ways. And the clear example of this is the man who was delivered from the demon in verses 23 through 27 of the text. Jesus spoke and the demon departed. It was as simple as that. And note, if you look in the text right now, look to verse 27, note that the people attributed the man's deliverance to Jesus' teaching. I'm quoting verse 27. They said, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. They were saying, wow, this is a powerful teaching, and it's having real practical impact in people's lives. So if we're experiencing Christ's authority, his teaching will enhance our lives. It will bring us joy. It will bring us contentment. It will set us free from the chains of the past. If what we're teaching or experiencing doesn't do this, then Christ's authority is not in it. There's something wrong. Does that make sense? So we can speak with authority today, and I would argue that we are called to speak with authority today based upon the Great Commission. But we don't get this power by seeking power. We get this power by submitting our lives to Christ and his call and his commission and trusting in his power to work through us. And this is kind of a process that takes a long time as we live and walk with him. But as we start to get it, as we start to flow with his will, and as we start to depend upon his power correctly, we will experience more and more the authority of Christ active in our lives and in our speech. And we will see results um, in the lives of others. We will know that we're on the right track when we see hearts illumined and lives enhanced. And by the way, in your own life, you should be experiencing the illumination of the heart and the enhancement of the life in what you're being taught and what you're experiencing in your church community. If you are not, there's something missing, and that's worth talking about and pursuing. So with that said, let's pray. Let's ask God to help us with this, and then we'll go ahead and dismiss. Heavenly Father, uh, we do thank you uh, that you have authority, and we thank you that you've given that authority to us. But even as we thank you for this, we recognize that it's a very sobering thing, sobering thing, because with much power comes much responsibility, and the fallen heart tends to crave power to serve ourselves. But we recognize that the authority that you give is to serve your kingdom and to serve the world. And we pray that we would come to know it in that way. I pray not only for myself, but for everyone here, that you would illumine their hearts with your word, that you would enhance their lives with the gospel. And I pray that you would use us as instruments to bring that same blessing to other people. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen.